So most of us know Neil Armstrong, the first man to set foot on the moon, but how many of us know of Buzz Aldrin, the second man? Tragically, due to Buzz being only moments behind, his name is forever second in history. For example, in high school, I learned about Neil Armstrong, but was never taught about Buzz Aldrin. But what if we went one layer back? What if a third person set foot on the moon behind Buzz, or perhaps was stuck in the landing craft, unable to exit? Even worse, what if they were stuck orbiting the moon, in complete isolation and near total darkness? This is the story of Michael Collins, the man behind the scenes in the world's first moon landing. Michael Collins was not born into wealth, not born into a family of astronauts who propelled him into his craft. Michael entered the military academy at West Point specifically because he could not afford a typical college education. Afterwards, his journey into space started rather oddly. Through a series of seemingly inconsequential decisions, he ended up at the right place at the right time to orbit the moon with Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. Upon graduation, he had the option of joining the Army or the Air Force. He thought that flying would be more fulfilling, and so he joined. In the Air Force, they give you the option to be a land troop or to be a pilot, and Michael decided to fly. He was then asked if he would be willing to be a test pilot, willing to pilot new and experimental aircraft. Knowing the risks, he said that he would. Through these seemingly innocuous steps, Michael became a test pilot. In the early days of NASA, a majority of the astronauts came from test pilots. Those who had already demonstrated themselves capable of learning and adapting to new and developing technologies. Collins is an incredibly humble man. He frames all of this, his career progression, and indeed his invitation to be in NASA, very modestly. Of course, NASA had many prospects, so Collins is clearly an extremely proficient yet humble person. His technical understanding of the math and science and his ability to control and manipulate the aircraft was pristine. His physical fitness was remarkable. He even ran up mountains as training for going on the Apollo 11 mission. As part of his training as the man left behind, Collins had to endure several hours of simulation testing in complete isolation. Despite all this training, he was left in the moon's orbit while Buzz and Neil descended to the surface. He had to watch and observe and wait. Alone. All alone. And years later, people know about Neil Armstrong. People know about Buzz Aldrin. Sometimes. He's somewhat well-renowned for being the second man on the moon. The first loser, essentially. But how many people know about Michael Collins, the second loser, the man not on the moon, the man left in orbit behind the scenes? Just imagine how much work he did to get himself on that space station. Years and years of physical fitness, of training, of education. All for him to get within viewing distance of the moon, so close and yet so far. That must be genuinely difficult. I can only imagine how Michael Collins feels about this. Surprisingly, Michael himself voices the exact opposite in an interview with Michelle Kelly. He states, I feel fine about it. I don't have any little hidden agenda or hidden feelings about Apollo 11. It's one of those questions I get asked a million times. God, you got so close to the moon and you didn't land. Doesn't that really bug you? It really does not. I honestly felt really privileged to be on the Apollo 11, to have one of those three seats. I mean, there were guys in the astronaut office who would have cut my throat ear to ear to have one of those three seats. I was very pleased to have one of those three. Did I have the best of the three? No. But was I pleased with the one I had? Yes. And I have no feelings of frustration or rancor or whatever. I'm very, very happy about the whole thing. I was personally quite surprised when I read this. As I was researching Michael Collins' involvement in the Apollo 11, I was already putting my own feelings onto him, assuming that he would be quite upset that he didn't get to actually touch the moon. It was interesting to see his own feelings on the event and how they were quite different from my own, especially given that he actually lived through them. In preparation for the mission, Michael was clearly very invested in the technical details. For example, Collins was asked if there was any concern between the American launch to the moon and the Russian launch that was happening in a somewhat similar time frame. To keep tensions down at the time, a conversation was had between Russian and American scientists to ensure that their spacecrafts would not collide. Collins states that this was essentially political nonsense. Obviously, there were tensions between the USSR and American in 1969, so lip service was paid to keep those tensions at bay. But the mathematical odds of two rockets set off at different times at different locations on Earth meant to land on the moon at a different time, meaning the moon would be at a different location during its orbit, 
and at different locations on the moon means that the odds of these spaceships colliding are essentially zero. Collins thought it was far more likely that a spaceship would collide with an asteroid than that they would collide with each other. Perhaps due to his role on this ship, Collins focused intensely on the technical aspects where other humans may focus more on the romanticization of the event. For example, a plaque was added onto the lunar module that they left behind, which reads, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon July 1969. We came in peace for all mankind. The plaque contains the signature of the U.S. president at the time, President Richard Nixon, as well as the three astronauts, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and Michael Collins. These signatures were autopenned, not actually written by the men who signed them. Apparently, NASA autopens a whole bunch of astronaut signatures for, like, merchant stuff. Regardless, Collins didn't care that he didn't personally sign the plaque. He was so intently focused on the upcoming mission, on understanding all of the technical details behind it. So though the plaque was mentioned a few times, it was very unimportant to him in the grand scheme of things. Collins stated, Before the flight, we were so beset with technical details that if someone had said, Hey, we're going to put a plaque on a lunar module, we'd have said, fine. And if they responded, it's going to have your name on it, we'd have said, fine. And if they had said, it's going to say this, we would have said, fine. I don't give a damn. Give me something important. Collins continued, So even though it may seem important from a historical or public affairs point of view, it did not loom large, meaning its wording couldn't kill them. Upon landing back on Earth, the astronauts had to be quarantined, as scientists were concerned that they could release moon germs and essentially kill the entire Earth population. During landing, they got into thick, heavy suits before being transferred to quarantine. Michael pointed out that this was somewhat dumb, as after opening the hatch on their landing craft, whatever germs they carried with them would be released onto the Earth. So quarantining the men was not a perfect system. Regardless, they remained in quarantine for about 21 days, and during this time, they exposed mice to lunar rocks and also to the men themselves. And if the mice died or had grandbabies that had crazy freakish mutations, well, the men likely would have been locked up for the rest of their lives. Collins laughs about that little tidbit in hindsight. He clearly remembers the quarantine facility quite nicely. A cozy home with hot showers, entertainment, steak, and gin. But it is a little terrifying to imagine that if those mice had died, you weren't leaving. It is some rather diligent science. It makes you respect the amount of thought that went into these landings, and the understanding of what could happen if something went wrong. After it was determined that the astronauts did not have moon germs, they were cleared to go. And go they did practically immediately on a world media tour as the first men to ever land on the moon. Michael, again, is extremely humble. He recounted the experience, stating, The trip around the world was very, very interesting. I think all of us felt, I certainly did, very honored and fortunate that they put up a whole big airplane at our disposal. The backup Air Force One, a big Boeing 707 that had a whole crew. There were three of us and our three wives. We got to go places and do things that normal people are not privileged to do. And it was a privilege. It was very tiring. I don't know. There's something about being on the edge and having to go through these receiving lines and remember people's names and meeting kings and queens and making speeches and flying all night and then doing it again the next day. There's something very tiring about that. I mean, I was physically ground down by the end of it. I think it was 28 cities in 33 days or maybe 33 cities in 28 days. But by the end of it, I was very tired. But on the other hand, I couldn't criticize five minutes of it. He tops his humbleness again when asked about his greatest accomplishments. He stated, Luck in the long run favors only the able. And that's kind of what I believe. I believe a lot in luck. I think there's a tremendous amount of just being the right age. Look, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins were all born in 1930, okay? That's a question of being in the right time. Now being in the right place has to do with backgrounds and how they became pilots or whatever. But there's an awful lot of luck, and I feel that I've been very, very lucky in my life to be in the right place at the right time. But what are my accomplishments? I don't know. I've been in the right place at the right time, and I've been able to do a good job when those opportunities were presented to me. I'm not extraordinarily good in one area and extraordinarily bad in another. I'm kind of even. Even Steven. The interviewer Michelle Kelly responds with, I think that's very modest. And Michael Collins answers, no. 
Michael Collins has clearly put some thought into the privilege, luck, and chance that brought him to be a NASA astronaut. It speaks to a deep humbleness and almost an insecurity that I'm sure is easy to relate to. I'm sure all of us have done things that are rather impressive in our lifetime. Things of which we can and should be proud. This could be anything big or small and of course is relative to your situation. But when asked about accomplishments, it's so easy for the mind to go blank. It's so easy to minimize your successes. So easy to attribute them to outside forces, to not properly own up to what you've accomplished. Michael Collins has done some incredible stuff, has had myriad accomplishments, but it's hard to see that when you're trapped inside of your own mind. It's easy to feel like an imposter. Michelle's next question about the challenges that Collins faced seems to illustrate this well. Collins replies, I don't know the answer to that either. The biggest challenge, I don't know. But coming from a broad sense, I felt that I was not as technically sharp as perhaps some of the other astronauts were. And I think one of the challenges for me was to make sure that I learned and retained and remembered and learned and relearned and pounded in my dull skull all the technical odds and ends and bits and pieces that I needed. So I thought one challenge was mastering this gigantic pile of machinery that is the Gemini spacecraft, the Apollo command module or whatever. That was a big challenge to me. And I felt I was probably not natively as well equipped as other people were for doing that. So that was one challenge. It's hard to know if in this moment Michael Collins is just being genuinely pragmatic and realistic, or if he's being self-deprecating of his own skills. He clearly was an extremely sharp tool in the shed, but I'm sure when you're among so many other extremely, extremely sharp tools in the shed, it's easy to feel like an imposter. The interview concluded with a question about the future of the space program. Keep in mind that this interview occurred in 1997. Collins replied, I'm Mars, 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 and Mars. I've always been Mars. Before I went to the moon, I was Mars. After I came back from the moon, I hoped that we would be Mars. George Bush wanted to go back to the moon and on to Mars. I think the really interesting thing in the future is Mars. If you need an international space station as a stepping stone to Mars, okay. Frankly, the International Space Station kind of bores me, like it does the American public. This interview took place in October of 1997, and barely one year later, in November of 1998, the first launch of the International Space Station occurred. Now, over two decades later, a manned mission to Mars has never been launched. We are seemingly very far from colonizing or even exploring Mars. If such a task could even be a practical reality. To appreciate the difficulty of planning such a mission, we must appreciate that the Earth and Mars both orbit the Sun at different speeds and distances, and the Sun itself orbits a supergiant black hole. The math to send a mission to land on Mars is extremely precise. Not that it can't be done, obviously, as we have done it before. We do also run into the problem of Mars's surface being basically uninhabitable. At around negative 65 Celsius, humans can't survive there. This is unfortunately one of the difficulties in being interested in astronomy, in exploring the vast space. It is also very far away, so very hostile, so very unlivable for humans. Tragically, Michael Collins passed away not long ago on April 28th of 2021. He was 90 years old. Though Michael had been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom when the interview with Michelle Kelly took place, he did not mention it as one of his greatest accomplishments. It is a testament of how fortuitous he considered his entire life and how grateful he was to have lived such a life. I went into this story expecting to learn about the past, to look into the psychology of those partaking, and instead realized midway through that I was imparting my own psychology onto the subject of the story. In some kind of way, I think I personally would be a little upset not to actually get to touch the moon. Obviously, I would also acknowledge the immense privilege it was to even be in that kind of situation. But I do think I would have some sadness that I couldn't make it all the way. Michael Collins was an incredibly humble astronaut. His legacy lives on in astronauts and astronomers today. And his name is forever enshrined on the Lunar Module plaque. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And thank you for watching. I will see you guys next time. Bye, everybody.